Our opening song this morning is page 469, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Uh, we'll sing all three verses. Let's stand for opening song, page 469. Super excited, uh, just loves his Lord, and he may actually even say a few words here before <laughs> before we're done. So I will uh, I will let him do that now. Dwayne, would you like to say a few words? First of all, family, we have uh, well here in the front row we have sort of family, yes. and uh, if yep. only if Ralph could be here, right, Dan? Because this is the third generation. This is Ralph's grandson, so to speak, spiritually. So yes. anyway, because Ralph Benedict. Uh, worked with Dan. Well, the Lord does all the work, but anyway, we, you know what I mean. There you go. Amen. There you go. So praise, praise God. The praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Share with us, Dwayne. Would you have something you wanted to... I never think I would ever make it out of Vietnam. Ever. It's totally impossible. All my friends are dead. Everything. I got shot in the head three times. How am I living? I don't know. God is good. God is great. God is Amen. Great. Believe in God, and you will have the best life there is. Amen. 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 In Jesus' name, we ask it. I bless all you people. We love you. God bless all of you. Amen. Amen. Aubrey, did you want to? Amen. 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 I remember when I started studying with Dwayne. <laughs> Vietnam was coming up because of all that he had gone through there. And it was such a relief to him to know that God will forgive all that he has done. Amen. And it's been a wonderful journey to see him grow in his love for the Lord. And now there's nothing that would stop him from following him. And that is a testimony. Amen. I swear, <laughs> that's the truth. <laughs> we know it is. We know it is. All right. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. 
Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Good. <laughs> All right. You're gonna bring that up. <laughs> All right. And now, Dwayne, because of your love for God and your desire to serve him with all your heart and mind and soul and strength, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Father, God in heaven, our hearts are filled with joy. We glorify and honor your name, Father, because you deserve all the praises and all the glory. Father, we come upon you this holy Sabbath. We kindly ask you to cleanse our heart, broaden our thinking, grant us more of the gift of the Holy Spirit so that we can worship in truth and in spirit. Father, we want to thank you so much for the baptism that has been happening in our church. And Lord, we surrender those people again unto you. Please, may you guide them, may you teach them, may you train them, and may your Holy Spirit direct their path every day. Any challenges and anything that is going to come against your will, Lord, we pray that you may push the power of darkness away from their lives so that they can cling unto you. I want to thank you for Wayne who got baptized today and promised to always follow you. Give him strength, give him courage, Lord, and let him dwell upon your presence in happiness and joy. For us who have been in the church for a while, we pray that you may renew our relationship with you. Please forgive us our trespasses. We pray that we may continue asking for your Holy Spirit to guide our path and fill our ways, Lord. Grant us the passion to continue sharing your word in our actions, in our speech, in our thinking, and let those who surround us, Lord, see you in us. Please glorify your name through us, because by ourselves and by our carnal nature, we cannot make it. Holy King and Father in heaven, we pray that you may fill us with wisdom in all ways. In a very special way, Father, we surrender our church members and maybe our neighbors and all around us who have been affected with the COVID-19 disease. Lord, we pray, Father, that you may heal them because you are merciful God and you don't like seeing people suffering. Please fill them with the joy that surpasses human understanding and above all, Lord, let them know that the doctors can treat, but you are the true healer and you can heal them in all ways. And for those who have lost their loved one, Lord, please fill them with joy that surpasses human understanding and let your angels feel the presence in their house. In a very special way, Lord, we remember the orphans, the widows, and the widowers. Please sustain their living and give them, provide for them their material need and their spiritual need most, more in all ways. Father, we continue praying for all the families in this church. We know that Families are the foundations of a nation and a society. Please feel love within families, Lord. Push away the power of darkness that brings argument and brings separation and brings diseases in families, Lord. We pray that your presence may fill each and every family in all way. We pray for all the clubs in the church, the women ministry, the men ministry, Lord, the adventurers and the pathfinders in all the world, Lord. For all the leaders who lead each and every club, Grant them wisdom, give them the passion, give them the joy of serving you in all ways. And for those who are back to us in the church, Lord, we pray that you may give them wisdom and lead all their ways. As a church, Lord, you have given us a special message, the three angels' message. Sometimes we even don't know how to share it. We pray that you may guide us in all ways. Above all, we bring all the evangelistic series and everything that is going to happen this year, Lord. Please take it forward in a very personable way, Lord. And above all, remind us that the freedom we have to worship will never last forever and you are coming soon. Open our spiritual eyes more and grant us, Lord, the passion to just do your will. 
Forgive us again our trespasses as a church and lead us to just seek after your presence day and night. In Jesus' mighty name we pray and believe. Amen. made you climb up those steps, but I said, nah, let's do it down here. Oh, yes, yes. And my wife's got the, got the gifts. So it's springtime, so instead of flowers, this is something that you can actually, uh, Albert, you want to hold that for me, maybe plant in your yard. And Since you're a gentleman, we didn't want to give you a bouquet, so we thought that you can remember. Right, rather than a bouquet. You can remember your baptisms every time you plant these flowers. Amen. Amen. Whenever they grow. Thank Amen. You. And I hope you enjoy this book. Yes. Don't leave yet. Uh, look for a motion to accept uh, Dwayne into our membership. I see one. I see two. All in favor, raise your hand. All right. Beautiful. We're so glad, Dwayne. This is your new family. We love you so much. Can you just stand for a picture? Stand for a picture. And let's have that prayer, too, before, before he goes. All right. Let's pray, shall we? Father God, we thank you for your work in our lives. And that which you have begun, you will perfect and finish. And so thank you, Lord. We're all a work in progress. And thank you so much for what you've done in Dwayne's life, Lord. The fact that he's here alive is a miracle, Lord. And um, you knew from the beginning of time that this day would come. And so we're so grateful that we can be a part of it. Just continue to bless him and make him a blessing. And Lord, now send him out to bring someone else in to your eternal kingdom. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you.
Amen. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. This is a fun day. I love this. Giving things away. <clears throat> um, I did some canvassing, uh, which is where you, in the summer, you sell books. I was much better at giving them away than selling them. Uh, that seems to be <laughs> something I'm better at. At this time, I'm going to call Brad and Tracy Hall forward. Uh, come on up. <clears throat> so for the last 11 years, <clears throat> yeah, please, yeah, and my wife also. For the last 11 years, Brad and Tracy have led out in something called Pathfinders. How many of you have heard of it? Oh, yes. How many of you have been a part of Pathfinders? Okay. How many of you have been a part of Brad and Tracy's Pathfinders? Okay, yeah, we have some of our kids missing, but we have a lot of helpers, too. And it's, you know, the thing is, when you thank people, it's like, well, who do you, who do you not thank, you know? And you go through that, and it's like, well, I'm just going to start thanking people. <laughs> and so uh, hopefully that's okay with y'all. But um, so we've got... Uh, <clears throat> Expensive We've got this expensive envelopes <laughs> that my wife made the cards. Oh, and so uh, thank, you. thank you guys so much for your service. And we have, um, they should never send me to get stuff. I mean, I, it's lucky I didn't get you a power drill or something. But anyway, there's a hanging plant. Thank you. So, you can so uh, <clears throat> yeah, you. we just really appreciate you guys. You. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> I would say there's a generation of youth that will never be the same because of the work they've done. So just close with that. All right. <clears throat> Indeed, this is fun. All right. And it gets even more fun because now we go to the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Jesus welcomes you, and we welcome you. Unfinished business study from the book of Zechariah. This sermon is called Where Glory Dwells. It's sermon number three in our series. <clears throat> Upcoming events, the next two weeks, we'll be back in the book of Zechariah in chapters three and four. We're in chapter two today. And then we have BCA grad. Uh, Jem Castro will be here. I understand eighth grade grad will be on the Thursday before that. Am I right? Cool. So that'd be the 20, do the math, 27th maybe? And uh, I think we're still looking at the exact time on that. Around 7 o'clock. 6? 7? 7. Okay. So that will be at 7. <clears throat> and... Um, I won't name our illustrious speaker for that. <laughs> uh, but just come and see, okay? And um, Jim Castor is uh, speaking for the BCA senior grad. Then Paul Punch will be here June 5th. You won't want to miss that. He's here to fire us up because we're going to have evangelism in October. And so that'll be super exciting. And so he's coming to share with us. He will be our evangelist in October. We like to bring in the evangelist sometime before in order to share, and that's exactly why he'll be here. Then you have communion, then camp meeting the last two weeks of June. They are planning a full camp meeting, but we will also be live streaming here. So eight prophetic visions in one night. That's what Zechariah had. We looked at the first two already. We looked at the red horse rider who was in, in the valley, in the low place, among the myrtle trees. We noted that the myrtle tree, when it is crushed, the leaves of the myrtle actually smell sweet. And so Christ can actually give us an experience of sweetness, even in our low times. And in our lowest times, we can know that Christ is there with us and among us. We looked at that. Then we looked at the second vision, which was the four craftsmen and the four horns. And we saw that that related to Daniel chapter 2, Daniel 7, the four kingdoms in succession. We looked at Joel 1 and saw the four stages of the locust. So that was a little bit of review. And when they were in the ravine, they knew they were in a low place. 
but they didn't know that the red horse rider was with them. Amen? And when the kingdoms were overtaking them, they knew they were in trouble with the kingdoms, but they didn't know that there was one who was above the kingdoms and working through the kingdoms and controlling and limiting the kingdoms as to what they did. And so today, as we look at the temple that is in shambles and the walls not been rebuilt in Jerusalem, and we look at the fact that Ezra tells us that there were some that had seen the first temple and they were crying. They're like, oh, this is nothing like the first temple. This is just sad. But they didn't see something either. They didn't see where the, the glory was to dwell and how impressive that third temple would actually be. So we'll look at that all today as we get into God's word. But first, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you are the unseen one, but the one who is in control behind the scenes. They say coincidence is your way of staying anonymous, but indeed you are there ruling the affairs of men and of nations. Today, Father, we ask for you to come especially close. Give us clarity of understanding. Give us conviction from your spirit. Make us change people as we leave this place and make us catalysts for the change in others that you desire in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, go to Zechariah if you're not there already. Chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 1 through 5 and then 6 through 13. Just 13 verses. Thank you, Sue, for reading that for us. And uh, appreciate that. But we will look at it again now, Zechariah chapter 2. And there is so much in these short 13 verses. First of all, review again, God measures nations by their relations to the remnant. It's not the other way around. You might say, well, nations are sort of in charge and the church has to do it. No, no, no. God's looking at the church and judging nations in relation to them and to the remnant. Hundreds of years before certain nations came upon the stage of action, the omniscient one looked down through the ages and predicted exactly through his prophets, servants, the rise and the fall of these kingdoms. Why did he do that? So we could have certainty that he is in charge of those kingdoms. Amen? That uh, principle is shown to us in the book of John where he says, now I tell you before it comes that when it comes or that when it happens or when it comes to pass, you may believe that I am he. God is in charge of everything that's going on. Now, that doesn't mean he's behind some of the policies that are being acted out. Certainly not. But he is in charge. We can trust him to know what he's doing and to be in charge of us and our lives We looked also at these names, which had such deep meaning to this whole book, and they should to our lives. And that is Zechariah, God remembers, Berechiah, God blesses, and Edu at the appointed time. He put it all together. God remembers and blesses at the appointed time. And that's the change of heart that we need to have in our lives, right? We want things when? We want things in our appointed time. (laughs) We want them now, right? This is a now generation, and it's a me generation. We want, we want, we want. But God changes our hearts, right? And he makes us more others-centered. And he makes us accepting and appreciating of his time plan, not ours. So God remembers and blesses at his appointed time Several keys for understanding today, and these are super important. Some of them, not just for this book, one in particular I should have given you last week because it's, it's crucial really, not just for this book, but for much of the Old Testament. But this one is specific for this lesson, and that is the man who measures, as you see, I have that as a capital M, I believe this man who is measuring is the same man who is in the ravine riding the red horse, the crimson horse representing his blood, I believe it's Jesus himself. The same man spoken of in Zechariah 6, where it's the man, the branch, with a capital B. Clearly there it is Jesus. I believe it is here also. 
And then there's a young man spoken of. That young man would be Zechariah. He's told to run and give the vision, give the message. So that's one key for understanding. Another one is this. God is nowhere near finished with the Jews and Jerusalem. Sometimes I hear Christians say, well, you know, don't keep your eyes. There's nothing really going to happen much more in the Middle East. I, I just... I, I'm, <laughs> I don't see that as biblical. There's a whole lot that's going to happen. First of all, there's going to be a large ingathering of the Jews, and much of that will take place in the Middle East. We have a lot of Jews here in America. Certain cities have a lot of Jews, but um, a lot of that will take place in the Middle East. Of course, another huge cataclysmic uh, <laughs> earth-altering, universe-altering event will be Armageddon, right? And that too will be there in the Middle East. And everything in Armageddon is in relation to Jerusalem, right? King of the North, King of the South. North of what, right? <laughs> the Jerusalem and Israel is the focal point of that whole event that will take place. And then, of course, there is the New Jerusalem, right? We, we all know about the New Jerusalem after, and this is where evangelicals, I believe, don't understand the, the order of things. They, they understand something's happening with a New Jerusalem, but they see that as coming during the thousand years, and then there'll be this thousand years of peace with the New Jerusalem. Whereas I believe the Bible teaches us that that's not the case. There will be a thousand year millennium, but there won't be anything happening really here on earth. But then after that time, right, the new Jerusalem comes down from God out of heaven as a bride adorned for her husband and lands where? It lands, that's why they call it the new Jerusalem. It lands where the old Jerusalem is. So God's not finished, nowhere near finished with the Jews um, and Jerusalem yet. And we're going to look at where that new city lands here in just a minute. I have a a map, and I told David in the back, I said, there's a few words on here that only he's going to be able to decipher other than my wife, because they're in Serbian. So, <laughs> but one more key, <clears throat> and that is this, and this is super important. You guys just went through the book of Isaiah, so right? Studying through Isaiah recently here in our Sabbath school. And this is super important when you're looking at these Old Testament prophets minor or major, much of the prophetic writings regarding the Jews in Jerusalem are what could have been. So although there is much still to come for the Jews and Jerusalem and that area, there's a lot that never actually happened. It's what could have been when you read those latter chapters, right, of, you know, kids playing in the streets and that God would love to have fulfilled that for them then, but he could not because those were conditional prophecies and they would not spread out, right? They wanted to keep the truth in. And um, unfortunately, we know what happened. But so much of what, and so then much of what even we'll read in Zechariah is what could have been for them, but what will be for God's last day Israel, that is his church. Super important that you understand this. All right, right here is Jerusalem. <clears throat> And that is the, if you see the sort of the dotted line going around, that is the city four square, right? That is, you know, where the new Jerusalem will land, right? Now, the new Jerusalem is quite a bit larger than the old Jerusalem, <laughs> right? When you read about it in Revelation, by the way, it's quite tall also, isn't it? It's going to be a massive city. As you can see, it takes in Asia, much of Asia, the Middle East, Africa, Ethiopia, up into Europe, and then you have the Mediterranean Sea there, which if it so happens that the land masses come back together, that that will be um, land there also. Now, I want you to note something about this map. This was God's plan for Israel to begin with. He wanted them to just expand and expand and expand out more and take in more, but they, they would not. And so the New Jerusalem will be right there with God and his throne right at the center. And what an exciting event that will be when Jesus comes. Our one sentence sermon for this sermon is this. 
Like I said, there's a lot of material in these 13 verses. So it's a long sentence, but it's one sentence. Jesus is our provider and protector, right? He's the, the divine husbandman. Some of you may not have husbands, but Christ will be your husband. Amen. He'll be your provider and protector. The one who chose us is coming again and will receive glory beyond what our imaginations can fathom. Amen. That's what we have to look forward to. And that's what Zechariah tells us about. So turn there now. Chapter 2 and verse 1 through 5. I've got the King James rendering this morning. I lifted up mine eyes again and behold and looked and saw a man with a measuring line in his hand, a tape measure or a surveying instrument. Then said I, where are you going? And he said to me, to measure Jerusalem, and to see how long and how broad it is. And behold, the angel that talked with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him and said unto him, Run, speak to that young man, Zechariah, give him a message, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls. For the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I, and this is emphatic in the Hebrew, it's not just for I, it's for I myself. Emphatically, I, says the Lord, will be their wall. A fire round about them, and will be the glory in their midst. Okay, well, let's unpack this a little First of all, think about this. If someone came to your house, right, and they're going to do remodeling, right, and so they got their tape measure. Say you're going to have a new deck put on. They go out and they measure the deck with their tape measure. What are you thinking? You're thinking, well, they're measuring the deck. <laughs> they're going to give me a price. They're going to build it back to the measurements that it is now because that's why they're measuring it. And so, so this guy goes out to measure, right, uh, which is Jesus, I believe, our Lord and Christ goes out to measure, but then he says, forget the measurements. <laughs> it's going to be better than that. It's going to be bigger than that, right? It's going to be like a city without walls that will just keep expanding. And that's exactly what God wanted was this, right? For Jerusalem not to be just kept in, but to expand out and out and out and take in the whole world so you're expecting someone to build something to specs that they've just measured, and then they say, no, no, it's going to be bigger. It's going to be better than that. And here's the lesson from that that I take. We have expectations of what the holy city is going to be like, what heaven's going to be like, what our relationship with God can be like. We have a little box that we've already measured. This is what it's going to be. And God says, no. No, it's better than that. Amen? It's bigger than that. It can be better than that. Heaven's going to be way better than we can imagine. Beyond our expectations is what God has planned for us. No eye has seen, nor ear has heard. Neither can it enter into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. Amen? It's better. Do you believe it? I don't hear any amens. <laughs> Well, Jerusalem is code for the church universal in which God dwells. This is super important, too. Now, there were promises to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a real place. It's a real people. Uh, but in the last day scenario, this is what it is. It's code for the church universal. God has people in all the churches that are out there. Amen. Do you believe that? Have you met people and you're like, that person's a Christian. They weren't in Adventist, but that person's a Christian. I sure have. That's the universal church. And that is what Jerusalem is code for, this building of the church. The rebuilding of the temple has to do with the building up of the church and its expansion to all nations. Remember the Jews, even into the book of Acts, right? They're like, we can't go outside of this little box that we built. <laughs> and then someone has a vision, right? There's all these creeping things and go and eat them. Well, that wasn't the message, right? To go and eat them. The message was, no, no, 
the, the, the gospel's for everyone, amen? It's to go to the Gentiles. All right, well, let me, let me prove these statements that I just made with a couple of verses, and then we'll go on. Simon, this is Acts 15, <clears throat> the Jerusalem Council. Simon has described to us how God at first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. The words of the prophets agree with this as it is written. So now he's quoting from Amos. After this, I will return and rebuild the tabernacle of David. So he's not talking about building a building here, right? Brick and mortar or stone and mortar, right? That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the Gentiles. Look at this in context, what's being said here. The words of the prophets agree with this, agree with what? That God at first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. It goes on. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles, which are called by my name, says the Lord. So this last day rebuilding of the temple is about rebuilding the church. It's about building God's people, that is us, but it's also about building God's universal church. And he's going to call some out of Babylon, as we'll see in our very verses here. A couple more scriptures on this, that there's not just the Jerusalem that we have uh, in the Middle East, but you have come to Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. So we're talking about, again, a church, what God is doing beyond um, Jerusalem. There's a last day prophetic understanding of this that has to do with the church. The church is made up of what? People, right? It is an organization, but it's made up of people. So we are the temple of God. Amen? That's what scriptures teach us. 1 Corinthians 6, here it is. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and that you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. God's wanting to rebuild a temple today, right? It's, a, it's a, uh, his church, but it's us as individuals. And that's where he wants glory to dwell. Where does glory dwell? Right here, amen? Right here in our hearts. I shared with you this, that that I myself in verse 5 was emphatic and that he will be the wall. And I think often we, we depend on things, don't we? <laughs> Instead of depending on the Lord. But the Lord says, I will be the wall of fire around you. Now, if the Lord of hosts, the God of all armies, that's over all armies, that's over all the starry host of the heavens, if he's going to be your wall, that's probably good enough, wouldn't you say? But we like things, you know, we like to depend on things. Well, you know, I got to have, you know, this and I got to have that and, you know, not sure I'll make it in the last days. God's got you covered, amen? Now, he may encourage you to do some things. I'm not saying he won't. But God says, I will be this wall of fire around you. I will be your protector. I will be your provider. God exceeds our expectations with his two things, protecting presence and satisfaction of all our needs. If we will not depend on things, sometimes we even depend on God's things, right? That's not what he says. He says, I will be, <laughs> not my things. I will be a wall of fire around you. He will satisfy all our needs. Greatest life you can possibly live as one lived for Christ. Amen. And so then he will be the glory within. So he's going to be the glory within his church. And he, that is as an individual, he wants to be the glory within us. Revelation 10, and we don't have time to really go there, but the seventh angel is about to sound. And 
the mystery of God is about to be finished. And if you go to Colossians 1.27, the mystery of God, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Not I, but Christ. Amen? That's the mystery finished in our hearts. God is going to have a people that just like the people that were there among in that low place, they were myrtle trees, right? They were just a lowly bush, but they had a sweet smell and savor to them. And their life was sweet even when circumstances were not favorable. How does that work for you? I love this quote. Actually, the Apostles is a book we're going to be studying soon when we get done with Desire of Ages. But I hope you will study Desire of Ages as David encouraged. But this from Acts of Apostles, God's church is the court of holy life, filled with varied gifts and endowed with the Holy Spirit. That's us, right? And that's also the church universal, but that's us. The members are to find their happiness. Where do you find your happiness? Where do you look for your happiness? The members are to find their happiness in the happiness of those whom they help and bless. Amen? That's what life is all about, right? Not me, 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 my time, do it right now, Lord. No, no, it's about helping others and blessing others. You, I, I know I don't have to tell you, when you bless someone else, who gets blessed? You do, right? More than they do. Um, works every time. That's what God is calling his church to be like. What if we were like that all the time? Amen. This church would not have an empty seat if we were like that all the time. Well, going on, we got to finish these verses up, finish this chapter up. Look on to verse six and onward. It says, ho, ho, or come, come forth and flee from the land of the north. By the way, this prophecy was never fulfilled in the time of the Jews. So it has to be a last day application, what we're looking at. Flee from the land of the north, saith the Lord, for I have spread you abroad as the four winds of the heavens, says the Lord. Deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwelleth with the daughter of Babylon. Now, this again has got to be a last day application. They've already left Babylon. They're back this is the remnant trying to rebuild. And so he's saying, come out of Babylon. Well, that's pointing to the come out of Babylon in the last days that we understand from Revelation 14 and 18. Verse 8, for thus says the Lord of hosts, there's Yahweh Sabaoth again, after the glory has he sent me unto you, the nations which spoiled you, for he that touches you touches the apple of his eye. Oh, we've got to stop there because there's two lessons that I really want you to get in these last verses. And that is, they're so precious. That is God. So the apple of the eyes, we're talking about the pupil, right? The pupil of your eye, which is something pretty precious, right? It's pretty precious to us. We protect our eyes. God amazingly protects our eyes, right? If you're mowing the lawn, have you ever noticed how many times you blink before the thing goes in your eye? I mean, I don't know how it works, but... God protects our eyes. Our eyes are precious to us, but think about this. As precious as our most precious thing is to us in our body, our eye, that is how precious you are to God. Amen? You are the apple of his eye. He loves you so much. That is the one lesson we're going to look at. The second lesson is I come, I'm coming. Not only does he feel that way about you, he wants to spend eternity telling you about it. Ah, oh, who wouldn't want to be there? Who wouldn't want to come out of Babylon with that kind of a God? Out of unbelief, confusion, sadness, grief, pride, sin, self, into faith, clarity, joy, peace, humility, righteousness, and other-centered love. He's calling us out of that. Go ye forth of Babylon, flee from the Chaldeans with a voice of singing, declare ye. Tell this, utter it, even to the end of the earth, say ye, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. I've been redeemed. How about you? Jeremiah 51, flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver every man his soul. Be not cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance, and he will render her a recompense.
come out of Babylon. Why would you want to stay there when he is looking at you as the apple of his eye? So there is the eye. We looked at that. And just a few few things about this eye, of course, gives us a glimpse, this speaking of the apple of his eye, gives us a glimpse of God's tender love for his people. The aperture through which the rays pass to the retina is the tenderest part of the eye, the member which we so carefully guard as the most precious of our members, the one which feels acutely the slightest injury, the loss of which is irreparable. And as I said before, this is how God feels about you. It's how he felt about Israel from the beginning. Deuteronomy 32 is the other place we find this phraseology. He found him in a desert and in the waste place, howling wilderness. He compassed him about. He cared for him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. Many and terrible have been Israel's sins and apostasies since, but he has never ceased to care and yearn for them. Zion in her desolation may indeed sometimes say to herself, Jehovah has forgotten or forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. But God's answer comes. Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget. So now he's contrasting, right? The love of a mother for her child, which... We see all the time, right? But perhaps a mother could forget to love her child, but I will not forget you. Amen? God loves you, my friend. And even while the dearly beloved of his soul is in the hand of her enemies, he jealously watches the conduct of the nations toward her, and wishes it to be proclaimed that he that touches her touches the apple of his eye. And in this tender faithfulness and love of Jehovah towards unworthy Israel, were they like this perfect group of people? And so, yeah, they're easy to love. Not really, but he loved them. Are we this perfect group of people that are always easy to love? Not really. but he loves you. He loves you. It's a picture of his unchangeable love and faithfulness to you. You are loved with the same love with which he loves his only begotten son because he sees you in him and are as dear and indispensable to him as the dearest member of your body can be to you. You are the apple of his eye. And then lastly, as we close, let's read these last few verses. Verse 9, For behold, I will shake my hand upon them, and they shall be a spoil to their servants or slaves. And you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Verse 10, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come. Jesus is coming soon. Do you believe that? He's coming soon. Lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, says the Lord. And many nations will join the Lord in that day and shall be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of thee. He says it again. If God says something once, we should listen. If he says it twice, we should pay attention. I will dwell in the midst of you. I'll be right with you. I'll pitch my tent next to yours. Oh, it's even closer than that. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. Before he had said that he'd sent him, but now that he'd sent him unto you. And the Lord shall inherit Judah, his portion in the holy land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. Only God gets to pick his inheritance, and you're it. 
What a love God has for us. Be silent, all flesh. God is getting ready to move the Lord before the Lord. Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. And so we have that promise in Revelation as Jesus is coming soon. I heard a voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is where? With men. He will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be their God. And oh, in case you might still have some tears left over from this life and its worries and heartaches and pains and sorrows. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be any more mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. Hallelujah for that. Amen. For the former things are what? They're passed away. Jesus is coming soon. He wants to dwell in our midst now, right, to prepare us for then. He sees you as the apple of his eye now, and he wants to spend eternity explaining that kind of love. I don't know about you, but I want to be there and be with him. Let's pray as we close. Father God, we are so grateful for your divine and precious promises, whereby we may become partakers of the divine nature Thank you, Lord, for promising to be a wall of fire around us and the glory within. And, oh, Lord, we want that. We receive that. Thank you that your plan is better than our little measured box could ever understand. And so, Father, may we trust you and believe in you in these last days as you get ready to do great things through your church, your united body, and through each one of us. Oh, Father, restore your glory right here in our hearts today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's sing about that kingdom. Here comes Joyce and our singers now. Hymn 633, When We All Get to Heaven. Sing him. 
for that day when we will all get to heaven. And Father, in the meantime, you're preparing our hearts for the mansion that you're preparing for us there. And Lord, we do not want to resist that work. So Lord, continue it. Please continue to mold and make us the unfinished business that you have in our lives. We give you permission to take care of starting just now. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. Amen.